So we're going to call the select board meeting to order for February 1st, 2021 at 6.01. Uh, as usual, these meetings are viewable on the FCAT Media channel over if you go to YouTube and search for FCAT Media, you will find all of our select board meetings. So first item on the agenda, the minutes. We have two sections of minutes today. We have the minutes of two weeks ago that we tabled because they weren't quite out yet. Did everybody look at those? Yeah. They look all right? OK. Well, let's put them both together then. Did everybody look at the second one? Last week's minutes? They, yeah, they're really good. Yeah, that's they're good. So I'm going to make a motion. We we approve both of the minutes from the 19th and the 25th. I second. Thank you. Uh, I'll say aye. Aye. Right, you're aye. unanimous on that. We have three warrants. So we have a vendor warrant for fifty-eight thousand four hundred and twenty-seven and sixty-five sixty-one cents. I can't read my own handwriting. We have a payroll warrant for one hundred and ten thousand three hundred and fourteen and eight cents, and we have a payroll deduction warrant for twenty-seven thousand four hundred and sixty-two and forty-seven cents. They look, they, did you look through the warrants? They look all right? Yeah, I thought I'd look good yeah. to me. Yeah, and one question. There there was an uh, a charge for $1,200 to tie in bond, but it was in the uh, office general expenses section. And I, I had a, I, I couldn't figure out on my own what an engineering fee would be doing in office general expense. So I wanted to ask Tom about that particular item. Uh, there may be a planning board fee and, and, uh, I'm not sure why it wouldn't be in their planning board. Uh, oh, probably because it's it's part of the MVP project. And uh, yeah, it's not under the planning board, but they're working with Ty and Bond for that. Not just 69 Main Street. All right. Other that, things to do. that would, so. I get it. That sort of is the least descriptive budget uh, <laughs> the thing possible, though. But yeah, I mean, not you, Tom, the, the classification as general expense is what I'm referring to. But um, yeah. Nice just to be all know who tie and bond is. So that's good. So I'm going to make a motion that we accept those three warrant articles. Second. I'll say aye, aye, aye. OK. Yes. So, um, with the, um, are we able to sign these now? Um, is has the software conversion or the issue that we've had? We, like I haven't signed anything in a really long time. I guess is my point. You could do something about that. Uh, yeah, we, I think we that they're on the table. We okay. have had paper things to sign. They just haven't been in the usual form. Uh, okay. And and one of them Mark left. And uh, Louise, if you can just make sure the others are ready to be uh, signed, that would be great. Okay. We'll Thank have to you. get on our snowmobiles and make it down to town hall tomorrow. <laughs> I'll ski. Oh, that's a good idea. So meetings attended by select board members. So Eric, you're usually up first. Uh, no meetings since last week. Phil. Yeah, so uh, I'll start most recent uh, and then work my way backwards just for a little change. Oh, okay. Um, Friday the 29th was the Deerfield Board of Health Frontier Regional uh, meeting to approve winter sports competition. And um, the numbers were all uh, go going really well. So I am pleased to report that we did set the all time land speed record for shortest frontier school committee meeting ever. It was uh, about 90 seconds. So um, but, but it was, uh, so, so the Thursday, the 28th was the FERCOG counselors budget hearing, um, which they had scheduled for an hour and a half, but, um, uh, it ended up lasting much longer than that. And, uh, it, you know, for, for those of you that don't know, our assessment from FERCOG is going up like three and a half percent. 
but I, I had a hard time with everything about that. I voted no on the budget. I voted no every chance I could get. I, um, and, and, you know, I just, the, you know, the, the, the way that they do business, you know, they present a budget, but it's a complete finished object and there is no openness to any, anything. And, you know, um, and what I was, mo what I did find out through close questioning of several people in this, um, and I, 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 unfortunately, it, it required close questioning to reveal was that they um, added money for a uh, position for public relations for a press spokesman. And I thought, you know, to add that position in the in the middle of a pandemic was just um, tone deaf, um, because, you know, that, that, that they had that they had. Uh, existed all this time without one. And then it further turned out when somebody else let it slip that they had spent a whole lot of money on a consultant to advise them on best business practices. It turned out that the suggestion for the reporter or for the press spokesman was from a consultant. Um, and it didn't even arise internally. And then further questioning revealed that they that, that was a $49,000 budget line item for a 20 hour per week position with full benefits. And um, I just thought that, you know, and that, you know, that there, there was an appetite amongst the 40 or so people on the call, which is a whole nother thing to, to, to take that position out. And they, you know, the, the, the way that they do their budget, the, you, they couldn't do it. They would have had to, they would have needed a week to redo the whole budget um, and then have everybody come back and vote on it again uh, be, because they, the, the, that's just the way they do it. Um, and the, the, uh, you know, the long and the short of it is their budget got approved, but there was a lot of people that were just, you know, selectmen from actually the town from, from us to Charlemont in sort of a little half circle in this part of the County, we were all know on everything. Um, Mark knows Charlemont well from the aggregation. And <laughs> yeah, well, there's the char the, it was Charlemont Colrain. Uh, yeah, um, you know, and, and then there's all these towns that I don't even I didn't even know they were in our geographic area that are on this me in this meeting. Um, but and, and the worst thing is, too, about half the towns weren't didn't even have a representative in the meeting and of the half of towns that did. Half of those were town administrators or administrative assistants, and they were just not a single one of them ever says a word in any of these meetings. And they don't really concern themselves with policy issues, I suppose. I don't really know. But um, there was just sort of, you know, a half dozen of us that, that, that seemed like we cared. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so I just, you know, the whole thing felt very rubber stampy to me. And I didn't, and I made my feelings very well known. And I was invited repeatedly to join their budget committees and their finance committees and their, all their committees and I'm on so many committees already. Um, so I, I, you know, so, so I, you know, the, 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 their budget's going to, is, is intact. It's got voted out and now it's going to, you know, be before us. And it's supposed to be, I'm the FERCOG representative. I'm supposed to stand up and say, this is why you should support this budget. And I just voted against the budget every chance I could get on Thursday night. Mm -hmm. um, but I was not able to persuade anybody. And ultimately, in order for to get that position removed, we all would have had to agree to come back this week, and I was the only one willing to do that. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, um, and then no, Wednesday, you know what they're in for later today. So this is good. Yeah, uh, and then Wednesday, um, uh, Tom and I ha were on a meeting with in the carbon credit project. Um, Tom and I were in a very interesting meeting with the DC represent, and I, I, I guess, Tom, is it, are you going to be talking about this later? Um, no, I was figuring you would mention it. Thanks, Tom. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so the, um, you, you know, when, when, when last we left off, we were just sort of dealing with Williamstown. We're doing this carbon credit, pro get, signing people up um, of more than a hundred acres right now to participate, uh, to put their land into a carbon credit uh, pack, package with the town's 200 acres and et cetera. And, um, you know, but, but in doing that, when, when you see how little of a portion of the towns of the 
Conway's square mileage, how little of that is the town forest, how much of that is private property. So I, I and, and I think I did say I was calling around to different foundations and this one, when Tom wrote that article or, or call, uh, when, when that article came out about the carbon credit a couple of weeks ago, um, one of the, this group from DC uh, sent us a letter and I called them up and I, we, we've been talking with them. And so it's this fa uh, American Family Forest Foundation and they're a subsidiary of the Nature Conservancy, which is uh, Nature Conservancy, of course, famous for it's one billion dollars a year in annual rent. Avenue, um, and it, always, always the, um, the the darling of the corporate uh, set. You know their their main sponsors. They showed us a slide. Their main sponsors were Dow Chemical, 3M, uh, Procter and Gamble. I mean, just um, you know that. But that what what they're doing is they have this pr program to pay individual landowners, private property owners. Um, for carbon credit, for carbon practices for, in their forest that are also necessary to, for, to, 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 do, to obtain carbon credits. So it's a secondary revenue stream for private landowners, and it can lower the threshold of participation from 100 acres down to 30 or 40 acres. Um, and so there's, there's a whole lot to it. We, 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 um, this was, uh, um, and on that meeting also was the Nature Conservancy from Massachusetts and Mass Audubon, and and they all have programs too, and so Mass Audubon wants us to have another meeting this week, and the D, the uh, FFCP wants us to have another meeting this week, so I guess we will, um, but the, it's the, these are these are these huge uh, environmental groups that that have revenue raising programs that are not custom made for us. You know, that, that they're programs and you, you go into a program and it's just like a big, just like a government thing. Um, and the, the- uh, I think those groups allow you, is, they pay you as long as you do sustainable forestry and you can cut, you can cut trees. Then, Right, but again, it's 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 the, everybody. It's a forest management plan is required. There's a, there's a lot that's required to it, and they, um, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't I don't want to talk without just like reading from the pro from the proper form that so, like says exactly precisely what it's going to be. But, um, you know, I personally am very excited about it because you can't give government money. You can't give town funds to private landowners. So then that was a whole bugaboo. We can't, there's that anti-aid amendment that we were recently talking about for in, in another matter in town, but it's the same thing. You cannot cause town funds to be given. Mm -hmm. So that was always a problem with all these grants, a lot of, you know, that um, FERCOG or whatever, the grants for this purpose could not be, the, the end result, besides the fact that it requires a match from the town, grants for this purpose cannot be ultimately funneled to private landowners because that's government money town money you can't do that so this is this is private foundation money they can they can give it to private landowners and we as a town can make it happen um so that's that's currently where we're at with that it's there's a it's it, it's really interesting we did find out from uh, uh ffcp we are the only small rural town in america even contemplating doing this right now <laughs> so um, there's lots of big cities, there's lots of bigger communities, but they, they're just, not, you know, tickled with us. And so the whole idea too, is that there would be boot, you know, we would get assistance in actually like, in, there would be people that would come here and, you know, like talk to people and, you know, give people information in a face, whatever. So um, like boots on the ground kind of a thing is, it was, because they know it, it's just sort of Tom, it, our town in terms of it's like Tom and us. And so we need help to do stuff like this. So that, it, that was a, that was a really forward thinking, forward looking, very cool, ultimately um, in fun, you know, whatever. So, but stuff is happening with that. It's, mm. it's, per, it's percolating. Um, so yeah, those were my three meetings. Great. Consider only four nights for three meetings is, well, uh, 
I thought you might mention the next amp visit. But. Ah, yes, thank you for, for yes. So um, when I was uh, leaving town hall to sign the warrants last week, I happened upon Bob and Joe and the planning board and all that. And uh, I tagged along for the next amp site visit. Um, and I, which was just interesting because I had never actually seen a large scale solar or a medium scale solar facility before. Um, so that was just kind of neat. And, um, you know, and, and that did result in the planning board making it a, uh, uh, an initial finding um, that went out and I saw in the letter and I don't, you know, the planning board does their thing, but I, I just, I, w I was impressed by the planning board and just how they go about their business. And I think that they're, the way that they do things right now, I mean, I, I haven't always agreed with everything that every result that they came up with, but I do agree with the process that they do. And that's really important. I, they, they do it the right way, I think. So. so I had two meetings. I joined Phil and Bob Baker and the planning board and Joe uh, with Joe uh, at NextAmp. And, and it was the first time Bob had seen the planning board. So I, I, you know, and he seemed pretty impressed with the access that he could get and, uh, and his ability to get, you know, his fire trucks, his pumpers or their brush trucks all the way to the very edge of um, the site all the way around. And he felt pretty good about his ability to put a fire out. And he asked for a couple additional, what they referred to as man gates, you know, basically a gate in the fence surrounding the site that they could, that a person could walk through. So uh, they could have called them fire man gates, I think, but. But anyway, that's, I thought the thing went pretty well. And, uh, and yeah, and the planning board then, afterward they went down and met with some of the neighbors and talked to them about what their proposal is. So I think that's going well. And, and we had a great call with, uh, with Mark and Denise, uh, I think it was on Wednesday, so last week, to talk about the aggregation. And they talked to us about a program that Conway and all of our towns could participate in. And we decided to have a conversation with the rest of the board today. And, and we'll get to you in a minute, Mark, don't, don't, don't get, to, don't get too anxious. But, uh, uh, and so, the, and so, and Mark said, Hey, we would love to come right away. And, uh, and so we invited him here. I don't know if we're your first town, uh, but, but it's great. So we're, you know, I think that you will like what you're going to hear. Um, so public comments, anybody here to do public comments? I don't see anybody for public comments. Um, so for old business, did you guys send in your, your uh, DLTA requests? Uh, Tom had handed out to us the, the projects that you're interested in uh, for the <laughs> for FERCOG uh, programs. So, if, if you want to get them to Tom, I don't know if the time's out. Tom, can they still get them to you? How soon? When's the drop dead date? Yeah, re real quickly, I've gotten something from the planning board. Um, and uh, also, we're, we're, we're supposed to put in for uh, COVID assistance and something from Bob, and I have something from me. So if you do want something in, uh, please get it in pretty quickly because I, I should get it done this week. Thanks. That's it for that one for me. Good. Don't make mine the only one, or I'll get what I want. So you got it. You got to get yours in there too. Uh, so new business. Uh, why don't we do Mark and Denise first? So, so the, uh, Mark, have you talked to our board yet, or is this a first? Uh, he, he, this is the first with a new board. Great, great. So, so uh, Mark, Mark is president of Colonial. And uh, and Denise is, you know, co-president as far as I can tell. So and uh, and and they they are the broker who runs our multi-town aggregation, and they're they come out and herd cats. I can tell you, we got 13 towns who are all, you know, quite varied, and and uh, I'm hoping they're in, in, enjoying, you know, what we're trying to do here. But I do think we have an aggregation that. That is, that, that is doing some good things, you know, not just for us, but, you know, you know, it's easy to promote aggregation when you look at what, what we're able to do with our 13 towns. So Mark, Mark explained a program that I will invite him to tell you about having to do with the new SMART program, the new SMART solar uh, 
uh, um, uh, you know, program for encouraging more solar to get built. And why don't you have at it, Mark? Excellent. And Mark, we have handed out a whole bunch of documents, so I'm not sure what Erica and Phil wrote, read, but one of the goals is that after you, we talk, you can go back and read a lot of the documents that Tom sent you, and they will probably make more sense. And I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible because it's, it's really not uh, a big, it's not a big change from what we're already doing. So the town has its, uh, its aggregation plan up and running. Uh, it's, it's actually performing very well. Uh, th this is kind of an add-on um, to create additionality uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, what this is, is the town is going to facilitate um, through the SMART program. That's just, I don't know if anyone knows about SREC 1 or SREC 2. Those are the first two um, iterations of their solar um, program backed by the state. And, and SMART is just the third iteration of that. Um, and through that, um, Colonials work with uh, the DOER to create a program. They've been trying to get the benefits in the hands of the low-income customers for a while, unsuccessfully for a myriad of different reasons. That being said, now it's, it's actually fairly easy for a community to say, hey, I'd like to help support that. And by doing so, all you're actually doing is saying, you build the solar, we'll take the offtake and deliver that benefit to the low income customers in our or the, or the residential assisted customers here in Conway. So what does it mean for, from you where you're sitting at, as the select board? It means you need to sign a contract with a, a supplier of, um, of solar. Here's the, here's the only hook is we need to, because it's smart, we need, they need to make sure that they have their offtake for the 20 years. I don't know if you guys currently do anything, but what that means is, is there'd be a, and it's not even a contract, it's just an MOU or a, a memorandum of understanding that allows you to say, yes, we'll deliver these benefits for the next 20 years on behalf of the residential assisted customers. What does the residential assisted customers need to do? Nothing. All they're going to do is get the benefit of this additionality. And that's the, the beauty of this, the way aggregation works. So you'll basically be, be able to deliver on your um, opt-out product right now um, in Conway. Uh, the price is 10-2, uh, which is fantastic because it actually has 25% more renewable um, content in it. The low-income customer in this scenario would be paying 8-2 or a 20% discount on their supply portion. On top of that, afterwards, after the bill, they get 32% residential assistant on top of that, that amount. Um, and and uh, Mr. Hutchinson had asked that we pull together some numbers. It looks like it's affecting about 42 current cu uh, customers in Conway, which is fantastic. That, that, that's great. Just more benefit during a pandemic, which can only help. Um, on your side, it doesn't require the select board to do anything other than say, yes, this is something we wish to facilitate this benefit and create the actual additionality, meaning your decision will, will create a, a, a solar array somewhere. It might be your decision and another small town's decision to bring it up to a megawatt or something like that. Or, you know, it might be a couple of small towns, but Colonial will aggregate those communities and get a project in front of you once one comes up. The, the goal here is full, full benefits for the, low, for, for the residential assisted customer. With, there's, there's no hooks in it. Customers come and go as they want. They, they participate in the aggregation. They'll get, as long as they're an R2 customer, they will receive this benefit. On, on the town side, there's no additional risk other than, listen, our goal is to uh, deliver this or facilitate this benefit for the next 20 years. That, that's the only thing. Colonial will take care of the rest of um, what I'll call the details, meaning working with the supplier to, to get the discount on everyone's bill, uh, working with the next supplier to, so that when, when they bid, they'll know that this benefit is part of, the, um, such, uh, part of the town's program. It won't require the town to do anything. We should be able to handle it. And I'm hoping that we're handling any of the, uh, any of the questions and those kind of things uh, that are coming to the town now. Things should have settled down and that we can help in the future create more of these, these uh, opportunities for towns to say, we're out here, you know, 
truly for additionality and benefits to our, our, our community. At 20,000 feet, without getting into the, the details, details, I'm happy to get into it, but I thought at this level, I just explain the details. I'm happy to, um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to answer any questions or, or dig in further about how it actually works. Uh, the one thing I do want to mention is the program allows us to do this seamlessly. So the customer's bill, as I mentioned, rather than it stating the, uh, the, the rate of the 10-2, it's going to have 8-2 on it. But other than that, they won't see anything and we'll take care of all the reporting so that customers won't see a net metering credit or an on-bill credit or any of those things. It's just a seamless benefit that they'll receive. So there won't be a lot of questions and customer confusion because that was important when we were creating the program. Uh, this, this is Tom. If I can just um, try to summarize. Um, uh, so this, this is a program for low to moderate income people. Those are the R2s that he's referring to. And if they get solar uh, energy, um, roughly, um, that's the SMART program, uh, their benefits in terms of getting, they, they, will, they will get uh, multiple benefits. One of them is uh, ha having these discounts. What the town has to do is sign an agreement with the solar company uh, saying that we'll let you do this, we'll let you um, work with our low, in, low to moderate income people for 20 years. And we also sign an agreement with Colonial, which is the Administrative Services Agreement. That's the second document you get. So there's the MOU with the solar company. There's the Administrative Services Agreement with Colonial that uh, where Colonial agrees to do all the work for us. So that's that's what we're being asked to do. Yeah, but all, all of the 42 right now L2 customer, R2 customers in Conway will participate. They don't have to currently be receiving solar or has nothing to do with how sure. they get their okay. electricity. They're just customers of, you know, they're just buying their electricity from the aggregation and they will get a lower price. They won't have to sign anything or, you know, it'll, it'll happen we, do need, we do need to have an agreement with the solar company. Uh, our That's the the MOU. Word has to sign an MOU with the solar company. Yes. And then a project needs to be built, Mr. Hutchison. But you know, at, at that time, we would come to you say, here's the project, it lines up, I'm making this up with Sutherland's and, and that's the exact amount that we need so that we have a project and this gets built somewhere in Eversource West and the benefits would, you know, once the project is completed, the benefits would start flowing to um, the residential assisted customers. I like the way, I don't know if you guys know Claire Chang, she runs a solar store up in Greenfield, and I really liked her short explanation was that the state has gotten a lot of grief from the SREC 1 and 2 programs, that it was very difficult for low-income people to participate. Their state taxes go and fund wealthier people who want to get solar panels, and, you know, that's that's tough to argue against you know those people are getting screwed to some extent and so the so the state has been working on how can we get more low how can we get more solar incentives to low income people who don't necessarily have the you know the ability like they might live in an apartment but they can't participate in solar and so so they this is one of their programs because they want to be program special for aggregations because aggregations are providing electricity for the town. And if they can just get the aggregation to participate, suddenly the solar company picks up 42 low income people that they can have as part of their program without them having to even, I won't say they don't know who those people are, but right now the solar companies don't know who, who, is, who is R2. You know, and so they have a hard time advertising their solar for, you know, buy solar from us. You know, they have a hard time. They don't know who to advertise to. So, so if, if they can sign this agreement with the aggregation, then they get included automatically. So that's the advantage of this program. They make some money and they give two cents uh, off of their price uh, to the solar, to, to, their R2, to the R2 customers in Conway. 
And, and the other good thing is that I bet there's a lot of people in Conway who might qualify as R2 that have never even thought about it. They might not think of themselves as low income, but this is low income relative to Boston. So, so you know, you're, you're what is it, 60% of the median income across the state or something like that. It's, you know, it's, right. it's not a giant number. And a, there may be, I bet there's more than 42 people in Conway that would qualify. And so the one thing that we as a board could do, or maybe that Colonia will help us do, is to promote, consider signing up as low income, if people are willing to do that. You know, when the grammar school changed the way that they do, the, the, the state changed the way that they do low income for the for reduced and free lunches. It used to be you had to sign up for it. We would get five a year. And th then then they made it. If you if you get mass health, then you're eligible. It's 40 per, 40 or 50 percent of the student body. Um, and that, Mr. Canada, that, that exact same thing exists. If you happen to get SNAP or something like that, that's a qualifying program. Now you have to go through the utility, but but you're exactly correct. That same that same uh, theory exists. If somebody knew enough to call to say, "Hey, listen, I'm getting these. There's certain benefits that you get, and if you are, if you participate in that program, automatically get that designation as a you know low, low to moderate income uh, participant. You get that designation. And then they would get two cents off their electricity. Well. well so in that scenario, believe it or not, if someone's paying an R1 rate, they get two cents off their electricity, which is lower than the basic service rate to begin with, you know, they get two cents off the aggregation rate. But on top of that, they get 32% off the total bill after that. So, I mean, the savings is, you know, it, it's a pretty good savings. You know, when you look at it in that fact, if, if we said, oh, you know, on a total bill that was $100, I'm just making up a number, but then you were going to save... You know, on the supply portion of the bill, which is normally around 50%, you save 20% off that. If you, you know, you, you, you're looking down at around, eight, you know, not, not quite $80, but maybe 85 or so. And then you get 32% off that 85. I, I mean, you're, you're almost getting a 50% uh, uh, savings in total. Now, it wouldn't exactly work out that way. Make no mistake. I want to make sure I'm clear. But it, it's 32% off that final total of the 85 you know, after we take off that 20% discount for the supply push. So, yeah, I, I got to tell you, when I saw this letter, the first thing that I did, I, I felt that the letter uh, had, had a, um, it, to me, it came across as a little salesman-y, and I always get red flags when I, when I read stuff like that, that, you know, all this and more at zero cost to you. Um, and just, uh, you know, and the, the, so, but you know when when and and so my questions are really sort of about you guys about colonial power or whatever uh, colonial uh, but because because I go to DPU I can look up whatever source his expenses were what their income was and what their profit was in this state but I couldn't find any information about that for colonial no, so no, we're a private company right so that's what I'm getting at. And oh. so, um, and, and you know, that, that and, and as you sort of are coming into this sort of quasi governmental or the provision of governmental services role, the lack of visibility into your company and your company's finances and your company's salary structures and compensation structures is what gives me the personal like lack of uh, being totally on board with this. And, and you know, um, the, the, the thing about government is we sit in a room and we decide what everybody's salaries are, what everybody's responsibilities are, what the services are that we want and everything. And, the, the, and, and I get really nervous when there's not just like you, but when there's the free agents sort of running around, pr dipping into the revenue streams that we have, but without the, the, the corresponding visibility to the, to the public. And, and I also have questions about the concept of uh, opt-in and, and, you know, of automatic opt-in. And, and, and I, I, you know, I, I think that that didn't really service all that well with the last one. I think it, most people, the majority of people in town don't know that they are in this program and that um, we would have been a lot better off had, had you had to do the actual work of signing people up meeting people face to face, answering their questions and, and convincing people 
that not just two people or three people forward, but the majority that, 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 you know, that this is a good thing and why. And I, I don't think we do our residents any favor by like just doing all these opt-in things with company with, so that's enough for now. I got a lot, I got actually more concerns than that, but. Um, no, and I just, I'll, I'll say that we, we're not, we don't plan on going public. So if that's a problem, it's not a, your, your personal, that's okay with us. You know what I'm saying? This is just something the town should discuss. It's an option if they don't wish to move forward. That's okay too. You know what I mean? It's perfect. That's what aggregation is about, this exact process. You get to state your case. Other people get to get to hear what they are, what the issues are. And if if you carry the day, then the, the town doesn't move forward. That was, uh, yeah. That was so when we when we went into this aggregation, we we put out a bid to try to find an aggregator, and and there were two aggregation companies, two aggregation brokerage companies that everyone said these are the two good ones in the state, and one of them is called Good Energy, and that's who John O'Rourke works for. So yeah. you could talk to John if you want to find out about about you know what it means to be a broker or what their role is. And, that's, and that's pretty the dark one, for there, Bob. Colonial. And and I got nothing but positive reviews from all of the select boards I called and talked to who had Colonial as their broker. And Colonial is the broker for Boston who just went just who just aggregated their electricity and and a lot of other towns. They're the broker for Leverett who went went who aggregated all by themselves and rather than being part of our 13 town project. I, I, I admit to being mystified by the basic premise that, that you know, one of the problems with us not being able to deliver services as efficiently as we want to to people is that we just didn't have enough for-profit corporations involved in the delivery of those services. Um, and, and that we're just better off with another one. And I, so I, I, I'm just somewhat jaundiced at the whole thing but nonetheless, I do really trust in your research in this area. And I have in the past voted to proceed with this against all of my better instincts because you had superior knowledge in this area and you have persuaded me in the past. Um, uh, so I don't know. So uh, I, see, I see aggregation as a good thing. And, uh, you know, I'm happy that that we are through our broker buying our own electricity and making our own electricity contracts rather than just having Eversource deliver whatever energy they want to into our grid. You know, we're, we're, we're signing contracts with, with uh, ourselves, with, with energy, with electricity providers. And the other thing that I like about a, a, a sort of point of order here, uh, yeah. Just to let everyone know who, who might be on the phone and not uh, visually here, uh, we currently do not have a quorum of finance committee members. We're, we're waiting to see if, uh, if other people join in. So we're still on the, um, the uh, discussion with uh, the electricity aggregator, Colonial Power. I did have a number of people call me up and they said, what's going on with this aggregation? You know, it sounds too good to be true. And, you know, and you do get a lot of electricity supply letters from various private suppliers. And what I can tell you is that the attorney general has done a big study of electricity supply. She would like to put an end to the, uh, to the legislation that allows private supply but she says the aggregation program is working very, very well, and people are not getting screwed. People are not being being mistreated or or led astray. And uh, and and when the uh, you know the, and the aggregations are all delivering exactly what they promise, as opposed to private supply who don't. Um. So yeah. I'm not going to convince you that a private company being in the middle of this, but you know, I wouldn't want Conway to be negotiating with the power with the power companies. You know, you really need to have somebody who understands the electric market in the middle there. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I yeah, um, where we can socialize everything, but we're you know that's 
we're, we're not there. Uh, you know, 100 years ago, Conway had its own electric railroad company, its own electric power company, and its own telephone company. And I think, you know, um, I'd, I'd like to see a focus of government providing solutions for people and government hiring expertise to make that happen. And I, um, this is like a lost opportunity to do that, I would think. I don't know. Well, we did hire the expertise. And I will remind you, though you all, of course, know already that the Conway Electric Railway Company never made a profit. <laughs> yeah, but that's because J.P. Morgan. There's a long history to that. But um, we got, yeah. Um, uh, um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, I, I, I didn't, I, I read it all. I, I don't, I can't claim to really have a fast and good understanding of it. Um, as my questions betray my ignorance, I'm sure. But the, um, uh, the I, I just, yeah, I just have a hard time with the whole concept. But did, can, can I ask if, if with, with, with Colonial, is, is what percentage of the business that you do is this municipal aggregate stuff? 100%. 100%. 100%. In Massachusetts. Right. So, wow. this and, this, and this is this is Denise. I will also say you mentioned the the opt out nature of it of the ag versus opt in, and it, it's a common common um, complaint I'll say from from a lot of people that you do have to opt out. Um, I just want to say that that's not a colonial decision. That's how the statute's written at the state level. So it's an opt out program. That's why you have to go um, to the DPU. And unfortunately, we're there for a year and a half long, long time, um, getting approval for the town to launch its program, but that's the way the statutes are. And so there's no such thing as an really an opt-in aggregation. Um, you wouldn't need DPU approval to do an opt-in aggregation because essentially that's what the, um, the third party suppliers do when they send you a notice in the mail, you're opting in. So um, you can do that at any time um, on your own with a third party supplier, but in order for the town to participate for all of its eligible consumers, you need to get DPU approval and, and it's just structured as an opt out program so that you can go out in the um, supply market and get pricing for kind of an established load. The suppliers kind of know what load they're getting so they know what they're bidding on. Um, and then all the risks on them to figure out who's gonna opt out. And you know, it's kind of turning the tables on them versus what happens with an individual contract. So just so, there's some clarification about why that is how it is, but we, we do hear that a lot. And I, Mr. Gann, I just want to let you know, believe it or not, years ago, the, there was a, the, the, uh, Conway was signed up with a, a municipal aggregator. It was called the Hampshire Council of Governments. And yes. They didn't get approval. So I'm not saying- it no, They didn't get approval. They were declared to be an actual fraud by the attorney general and people went to jail. Well, I didn't know that anyone went to jail, but- I, Yes, I'm, they did. Okay, but I'm saying you, that would have to be a public entity with an open, and they were actually trying to do this. And I think it takes a little bit more expertise or, you know what I mean? Someone focused just on the markets for them to pull it off. And they just, I don't know that they ever acquired that kind of a skill. Not saying they could though, but they didn't. Yeah, um, I mean, it's an apples to apples comparison. You were asking about. Yeah, yeah, you're right. right. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention it. Yeah, yeah, that's the last time the municipalities tried to do it. It ended up some of the municipal people went to jail and the whole thing was declared to be a fraud. So that that is true. Yeah. Um, so, so when so when we had this call with Mark and he and he announced his program to the 13 towns, you know, we invited him to come and talk today. And our intent was to have this as a conversation. And if if you and Erica overwhelmingly want to support this or if you you know, we could vote today to sign this letter of, of the MOU and the uh, administrative services or we could do it next week. And my pr preference would be to do it next week. And I don't know that we need Mark and Denise to come back again, but they would be happy to if we want them to. I feel like I would appreciate a little more time to, I mean, cause I, I like, I read everything that, you know, leading up to this meeting, but I still feel like I have a lot of questions and um, I, yeah, I would appreciate an extra week to, you know, fully digest and appreciate. Well, their emails are on many of the letters that you got. You could yeah. write them yes. questions yeah. and they're both wonderful about responding and and uh yeah so the one thing about that when 
when, when it came about the public uh, 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 meetings and, and whatnot, the, with the aggregate, with the last time, the, the, the decision to just to have like a couple of public meetings open to people from all 14 towns, I, 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 I don't think that helped us out at all. And I'd really like to see you guys go into each town and offer a separate meeting and, and just try to drum up support for this. And just not leave it up to the select boards of each town to have to explain this to everybody. It, I, want, I just want to say we did offer that up. Uh, it just given the pandemic, everyone said, you stay where you are. We're going to just do a Zoom because normally we would be out to everyone's Council on Aging and, and another, you know, another general meeting. But that just was not able to happen given the uh, current situation. We're happy to do it any time in the future. That's, you know, that, that's our job. That's what you've hired us to do. We're happy to do it whenever you'd like to do it. But we did publish stuff on the website and we sent out a survey to everybody in town about the aggregation and trying to get a feel for what their goals were for the aggregation. I thought that went well. And we got, we got about 350 responses back, which for a survey was unbelievable. A lot. <laughs> All right. So next week. Great. Okay. So Tom do, or, or Ellen, do we have a quorum? I see Roy. Roy and I, I think that's it. Can we, can we um, thank you mark thank you denise yep, yep. thank you mark thank you yep, denise thank you thank you have a good night yeah have a great night good Stay warm safe. up mark. good warm up <laughs> have a great night bye how are you doing hi everyone hello 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 so normally we can everybody hear me hello can you hear me oh, yep Normally we do the budget hearing now, but we don't have a quorum from the finance committee. Yeah, I'm sorry about that, uh, everyone. Um, I mean, I don't know what happened to Steve. He's pretty reliable. I just reforward him the Zoom link to the meeting. You know, maybe, maybe he's out shoveling. Hopefully he's not stuck in the snow. Yeah. yeah John, well, I think we go. We can go ahead anyway. Okay. You also have Frank Tech here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming and sitting through that discussion. Sorry to be the skunk at the garden party, as always. Oh, no. So, Tom, do you want to lead this, uh, this uh, the budget stuff? Um, no, I, I'll just mention, because it, it does have general update on there. Um, Lee has just finished uh, the, the valuations for the for the town and then sent them off to the state. So we're just waiting for state approval for that. And then we can start working on the revenue figures. And I should have uh, the Excel sheet for the budget uh, ready for you soon. And I turn it over to, to Bob to uh, uh, welcome uh, the technical school and the town clerk and the board of assessors. So we have Russ and Dick here from the technical school. Do you guys, so, so we didn't get a, a, a document that we could distribute to the board ahead of time. So you're going to send it to us and show us. Right. That, 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 yep. Because uh, uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Can you guys hear me or no? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yep. We didn't send one out because we are meeting with our finance subcommittee on Wednesday um, so you're about to hear more information than they currently have. And our budget doesn't get its first reading to the full school committee until the following Wednesday. I believe that would be February 10th. So the reason why you don't have it, because it hasn't been reviewed yet by the committee. So it won't change the numbers for Conway and it won't change where your enrollment currently is. And I think we can give you an idea of where you currently are and um, what, it, what to be expected for next year. Great. Your budget never changes. You're very good. So, <laughs> what are you talking about? You well, say that um, after they give you. A, would it you don't possible? say that before they give you the budget. You say that after they give you a good budget. <laughs> 
Okay, can I give a, um, a quick probably five to seven minute overview of where we are currently at? And yeah. in that overview will include, um, you know, how we're spending the district's money and where we are with Conway and, um, this, and then where we are with the students. So you if I could just share my screen, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yes, if I could. So Tom will have to enable that for you. He's our host. Yep. Yeah, Tom just did. Thank you very much, Tom. And I will get to Conway's right here. Okay. Um, so what we have here is um, some of the initiatives that we've done over the last year or two. Um, we have enhanced our advanced placement courses. As many of you are aware, last year was our first year with the veterinary program. We are now in year two, which means that all freshmen and sophomores are in the program. By next year, sophomores, I mean freshmen, sophomores, and juniors will be a part of the program. What you aren't quite aware of is that we are intending to build a veterinary clinic utilizing our, um, within the confines of our budget without going for additional money out to the towns because we have the availability to do something that a lot of schools aren't designed to do, which is we can build our own facilities. So many of our students are gonna be participating in building our new vet clinics. So that's why we're gonna be able to more or less afford it. Um, we also put in a, uh, and that should be done probably in the next year or two. Um, we have a co-op coordinator that we hired the previous year and we had about half of our seniors out on paid co-ops. We started a woman in trades program to provide more education and availability for female students in the traditional trade programs. That's been a really big success for us. Um, we continue to build houses. We built two in Irving and we will be getting one in Greenfield next year. Um, we revamped our welding shop program, our electrical shop program. We continue to offer summer services with Tech Connect. We have an Ingenuity Credit Recovery and Remote Learning Program for students that are on full remote or need credit recovery. And over the last few years, we were able to start, we are starting a new medical assistant and LPM program next fall. That's exciting because we look at the labor market and we can see that a majority of the jobs, the highest percentage of jobs is still in the medical area. And now we will have a training program to get students even better prepared for that. And we were able to get a 250,000 competitive grant. So over the last several years, we had a $500,000 welding grant, 275,000 veterinary grant, $200,000 machine technology grant, 100,000 Perkins. So we're more than 1.2, $1.3 million in competitive grants over the last several years without ever going out to the towns, which allows us to do a lot of um, initiatives for the students. Some of the increases are gonna be explained to what, um, because of our significant increase in enrollment. We added a guidance counselor. The directives from the Department of Education is one guidance counselor per 200, 250 students. And right now we have 566 in the building and we're expecting probably closer to 610 by next year. So we added a full-time guidance counselor that can help out in the vocational realm as well. We are adding a financial literacy course. Now this isn't necessarily an ad, it's getting back what we lost. We hired a co-op coordinator at a 1.0 position. She used to teach career enhancement financial literacy, but now she's our full-time co-op coordinator. So we're noticing some of those skills. We're trying to bring those back to the students. So that's a course we're kind of bringing back that we kind of lost when we added the co-op coordinator position. We need a full-time English and half-time history. Well, it, it will be a 1.0 position, half English and half history to help close some of the enrollment gaps that are going on. Um, we're gonna have a vocational support paraprofessional. As our shops increase in size and numbers, we'll have somebody that can help out um, because if you think about it, even in a veterinary shop, you need somebody to that's professionally trained to hold the animal, which is one of our veterinarians. And then the other one will administer the shot, but you need another one to observe the students. So there's always that need for that extra support personnel. 
we are adding, um, we are currently at a half-time librarian. We're going to go to a full-time librarian. We do have an accreditation coming up in the next few years. Their strong recommendation for us was to move to a full-time librarian. And after further research, we found that we were the only Volk school um, in the state that we could find that didn't have a full-time librarian. So with increased enrollment, that is about time. We do need to get back to that. And again, um, we're, with the enrollment increases, we're adding a half-time dean of students that can also take over as the academic curriculum coordinator. Now, this isn't necessarily an ad. If you go back about four years ago, we had an academic coordinator and a vocational coordinator, but back about six or seven years ago, we did have a decrease in enrollment, so we cut back on the academic coordinator, and now we uh, only have a vocational coordinator. So we're trying to build that back in a different capacity. Um, so just some quick pitches. There's our veterinary clinic that we built from our students and our money we received from the grant. Um, it has all the modernized equipment in it from x-ray, enough x-rays from um, really high end ultrasound machines to diagnostic chemistry labs like you see here. Um, it's a pretty advanced um, equipment that we have now. We refurbished our cafeteria the previous year and um, electrical shop space. We added a whole other floor. Of course, our students and teachers were able to build that. Here's one of our houses that we sold in Irving. And with a welding, we got this big robotic welding on so students can be better uh, skilled and employed in their interviews. We're finding more and more job placements and co-ops uh, having these type of machines. So now that our students will know how to operate them, they'll put themselves in a better position to be employed. Um, that's the big welding arm. And we refurbished, uh, well, we had a brand new um, repair paint booth for the collision repair, which is um, very important. Um, and then this is some of our community stuff. We do our staff get crazy once in a while and we do things for the holidays and for Halloween and things like that. So we had about 300 kids in grades K through four at this one event. So it's kind of neat when you can reach out that have nothing to do with vocational trades just to give back to the community. Um, and we do the same thing with the car show and open house. Now let's get to the numbers. <laughs> um, we, as you can see, um, we are growing in enrollment. As you can see the trends, um, when we were declining in this area right here, this is where I was talking about earlier, we reduced the academic curriculum coordinator in those other positions. Now that we're growing back in enrollment above to where we once were, and now here we are this year, we are projecting next year to be in this ballpark minimally. Now this is not counting our students that may be out of district. So we're gonna be, um, and that's good work for our teachers, um, the work that they're putting in in our vocational shop. So we're growing. So what does this mean for Conway? So Conway, we're currently right here. So your assessment from last year to this year is gonna drop by one student. Next year, you don't have anyone graduating this current year, and we currently have four applications. That doesn't mean all four are going to choose to come here, um, but if they do, right now, it would be eight students. So you would be getting back to the enrollment you previously had in 2017 and 2015. So you were in a low for a little bit. And I think you're gonna bounce back and you'll probably stay in this range for a little bit as well. Um, but that's just giving you an idea of where you're at. As far as your assessment or minimum per pupil cost are concerned, even though the governor's numbers came out, what happened there were, was Franklin County Tech was with some other schools as well where our brand new system software um, did not upload all of the calculations correctly. So we met with the state and the district offices and they're gonna recalculate our October one numbers to accurately reflect our enrolled students. So that's why you're not gonna have a number. We'll have that by Wednesday, um, but we don't have it right now. Last year, you can see you're about, our average, our all members towns were 13,000. You were 18,000. 
you're probably going to still be in that same range. The only thing that you can probably count on is that you drop from five students to four students. So any way the calculations come out, you're going to be less in your assessment um, for this coming year than you were last year. Um, so that's where you are there. As far as our capital assessments, probably about um, now it's going on six years. Uh, we had a windows and doors and roofing and paving project. And that figure that you paid last year was here and now it's down to here. And as you keep going through the cycle, it will fluctuate, but it's lower overall. This is all of our towns. It's 196,000 for the town of Conway, $6,200, $227. And I think that's going to probably stay right in that range as we go through that particular cycle. And special education population, this is some of the things that you see us add over the years, like a school adjustment council, special education paraprofessionals. When I had that paraprofessional earlier articulated, it was in the vocational shop because we still have students that have special needs going into our vocational shops and they need that support. As you can see, we're the highest percentage of special education population in the entire county. Um, out of all the regional high school, this is high school age. This isn't um, the elementary school age. And now let's get to our budget. Here's what we currently have. Again, we don't have two major items. I'm gonna highlight them for you here. We do not have this item right here, a town from assessment uh, for taxation, they're recalculating that based on the system software ever from PowerSchool. And they're gonna recalculate this next one, chapter 78. So we can accurately come pretty close and predict what the other items are gonna be because uh, regional transportation ticked up a little bit. Uh, tuition from non-member towns, we're utilizing a little bit more to offset the budget, but we're getting back to where we were a few years ago, as you can see here. Uh, tuition from our pre-employment program, we're going to have $100,000 here. And, and then our other revenues are, um, you know, the, the interest reimbursement from Medicaid, surplus equipment's gone up a little bit as we continue to refurbish shops, there's more surplus equipment to sell. So you see that number going up a little bit here than it was from the previous year. And then appropriation of E&D, right now we're in this range. So we don't have the final figure there. On the next sheet, as far as where we are with the uses of funding, I'm gonna let Russ Cobra speak to this column right here as we go through where our budget is currently looking at for revenue. So Russ, if you're on board. Hello, hello folks, I'm Russ, the business manager at Franklin County Tech School. Um, as Rick has highlighted, uh, the revenue side normally by now we know we have a very good estimate of our town assessments and because of the state uh, getting some of our data and recording 170 some odd freshmen as regular high school kids, not vocational high school kids, uh, we ended up shorted on our, our chapter 70 side. So uh, like Rick said, I, I think you're, you're safe, safe in knowing that your assessment is going to go down. It's just by how much and we'll have that figure for you shortly. Um, on the on the uses side, you know the side of that we do all our spending. Uh, Rick has up on the screen, and you can see pretty much across the board the increases in each of the functional categories. Um, the categories we use for our our um, appropriations are dictated by DESI. So these these are the categories you would see on anybody any school's end of year report to DESI would be in these categories. So district administration, instructional services, student services, pretty much down through, you'll see many of those um, trending upward and that is in direct correlation to our, uh, our student growth. Um, a couple areas of note that I wanna toot our horn uh, on is in the uh, insurance areas we have uh, some growth because we're gonna have more employees, more active employees. Um, but if you look at the retirees insurance, that's declining. Overall, um, I believe Conway's a member of the Hampshire Health Group, um, but we are a member of the Hampshire Health Group. That group has voted a 2% decrease in insurance rates for next year. 
So um, our budget will reflect, would have reflected a 2% decrease, except that we are growing in the employee category. So, so we've got a little bit of growth there, but, but pretty much there's no super surprises. Long-term debt is the bonding that Rick talked about down below. We have uh, the rental of lease equipment. The second from the bottom line is our energy project that we did. And we're approaching the end of, of that lease, which got us brand new rooftop units, um, re, uh, resealed our, our building for weatherization and made other motor upgrades in our facility. So that that is coming to an end fairly soon. So that cost will slowly disappear, but we have reaped more savings uh, than that line item has shown in our budget over the years. So we will have a fully balanced budget where we're expecting our finance committee has given us the mission of keeping town assessments overall under 3% increase. Um, so overall, we may end up in a 2 or 3% range for our towns. But obviously, the mileage changes depending on the number of students you send us. So in Conway's case, you're going to see your assessment go down. Town of Greenfield sending 23, 24 more students. They're going to see their assessments going up. But overall, I think we've tried to keep our growth in our town assessments at or below a pace of municipal revenue growth that DOR calculates for you all at your towns. Um, we are healthy in our, what we call E&D, you guys call free cash. We are fully funded in free cash. And we're gonna use some of that funds to offset your assessments for next year. What uh, percentage? Our, our, our we're probably, we're over 5%, so we're about 6%. So the state would have forced us to give you a percent back anyway, um, but we're gonna use almost all of the, um, I'm thinking we're gonna get certified at $711,000 in our E&D. And I think on Rick's other screen, we use, let me see, 550,000 of it. 575,000 we'll use of our of our E&D to balance next year's budget. So can, can I ask you about uh, just a couple of things that district, the administration costs in the E&D, this is Phil Cantor. Um, yep. So the, the administration costs I see go up about, what is it, about seven, eight percent or so. And I guess that's the curriculum coordinator, but um, you, the fr front, you're, you're about $200,000 more than Frontier's administration costs and Frontier has a larger, larger student body. Um, so could you just give some insight into why your administrative costs are as high as they are? Frontier has a larger student body? No, well, not at the high school level. I think right, middle, the biggest... and, middle and high school, yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe we're comparable. Last time I compared ourselves to other schools, we were in, the only thing we may have in our, that we carry in our ad administrative costs that other schools tend not to is an uh, information technology director. Don't know where Frontier codes theirs in the- in Separate, the, line the, in the fund. Separate line item. Separate line item. Yeah. Separate line item. Um, all right, that makes sense. Um, so and then the 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 E and D thing the be like I um uh, we we never hear from you sort of after your budget is passed about E and D like most most schools save a portion of E and D for in case uh, it actually is a rainy day um, for, so so but and and then they have to go back to the towns for permission to spend it but we never hear from you with regard to any, so, so do you always spend the E&D um, on your budget and, 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 and sock it away for that? Because at, uh, the front, Frontier always has the practice, 50% of the E&D's, the E&D always goes back to the towns to lower their assessments before, so that at town meeting, the budget is more palatable. Um, but I, I, and I, 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 it's not your, it's your policy to use it for your next year's budget. I guess is what you said. So here's here's what I've learned over the years of doing this. Um, we used to do it similar to that. If you actually look at the statutes in the Mass General Law, 
you can't schools schools can't use E and D like you like towns use free cash. We can't go to a special town meeting or anything during the year to use it. So, which I was doing for a bunch of years, and for whatever reason, I must have had a rep at DOR that maybe <laughs> didn't like me or whatever. But they they slapped us on the wrist and said, "You have one time to use your E and D, and that is at annual town meetings." So to put a chunk aside for a rainy day, we can't do it for the upcoming fiscal year. So Rick and I's philosophy is we use almost all of our E&D to offset the next, the, the upcoming year's budget. We have a tuition revolving fund, which to, again, to compare to Frontier would be like their school choice revolving fund. That to me acts as our stabilization fund, as, as our rainy day fund. And we are we are healthy in that fund by by probably six seven hundred thousand dollar balance in that fund alone. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Actually, <laughs> to me at least, I don't know about anybody else. Um, and then uh, the tra transportation. Are you you're coming up on your uh, the, the need to uh, do your five year transportation contract again, right? We are. Yeah, we probably what in year four, right? So I, th I think it's well, a couple years three. out. I, I, yeah, year three. So two right. a couple more years. I was hoping yeah. to retire before the next one got renewed, but I think I'll be around for that. <laughs> it goes out to bid in year four, though, doesn't it? It would go out to bid in year four to set it up. Yeah, yeah. So, so here's here's a request from Conway that um, we want it restored so that uh, so that Con Conway could pr participate in that, but we need we need the ability to opt out if we don't like the number, like we always used to. Um, the last time you did it, we, we did it. We couldn't opt out, so we couldn't participate in that. And even though we love Gripco, we love our transportation thing. It helped us. It helped us keep our own costs down for sure. Being able to participate and at least have a plausible option. So. Uh, well noted and we well tried said. it both ways we tried it with the opt-out clause didn't get yeah. a ton of bidders and then we thought maybe if everyone had to opt in that we would get more transportation bidders and that that didn't help either so i think we will probably go back to an opt-out but good good um yeah so that's i it's it's really hard for me to do snap budget analysis for the seeing it for the first time i i understand all the reasons why but Sure would be nice next year if you guys come back with a, a an actual budget in advance so that like we can look at it and get more questions answered, figure out more questions to ask. I would yeah, be more than happy um, to give Tom when our budget book is again we're we're kind of jumping in ahead of our even our finance committee. So I know how you public boards don't like it when your administrations go out and start speaking to other other folks mm -hmm. before you've had a chance to to digest it. So that's why you get minimal information tonight. But I, uh, I usually send to all town administrators our detailed line item budget book uh, once once the our school committee has had uh, plenty of time to chew it over. So um, I'll ask Tom to forward it out to all of you. And then if you have questions, we, we can either Rick and I could either come back to a meeting or um, I'll give Tom our our email addresses and phone numbers and folks can call because we, we try to be real transparent on on that side of it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I'm sorry. I thought your uh, finance committee meeting was last week. No, we ended up it. it the, the, the first reason why I was postponing you, Tom, was because the governor's numbers wouldn't be out. <laughs> so th those numbers came out last week. And then we our finance committee is is actually on Wednesday night. Um, so when you gave us the option, um, I didn't want to put you off a second time. So, so we jumped on board to, to do our dog and pony show tonight, but it, it'll be out shortly. And like I said, the, uh, Rob O'Donnell at the, at Desi is, is doing a recalculation on, on the error that happened on our foundation enrollment. And, um, we told them we needed it by Wednesday to start to share numbers with our school committee. So as soon as we've got a, a new minimum contribution number for Conway, and we can recalculate for all of our 19 towns. I'll get that. I'll get that info out to Tom. So hopefully, by the time next time your your finance committee meets, you've got uh, a real Franklin County Tech estimate on town assessments for next year. 
and you, you guys know that we're waiting on your uh, electric uh, class and your, your plumbing class to help us with uh, our highway building. You know that, right? I did not, but I, I'm sure I could, one of our vocational coordinator knows that. Yeah, they do. They do. There was, they, yeah. <laughs> and I understand the delay in it, but uh, just so that you know, we are still waiting for that. And but we're very, <laughs> we're, we are very grateful for the help when it comes. And I know it will be coming. So, but and just so to I'll, let you. Just to let you guys know that seriously, it, it makes a huge difference for our town for that project. Yeah. And uh, somebody should really say thank you yeah. to you. So thank you. Sure. We appreciate it. Thank you. Alan, do you have any questions from the Finance Committee? Well, thank you. I, I have two. The current and this year's enrollment, 730 students. How many are out of district? And that's number one. Number two, what prompted the uh, full time equivalent for the financial educator? Okay, so the financial literacy um, was a program we had about three or four years ago. Um, it, it was called Career Enhancement. And we got rid of that course because the teacher who teach it is a dynamic um, instructor who became our co-op coordinator. So she had all her efforts in that area. So we kind of neglected putting in a viable financial literacy program for our juniors and seniors like we used to have. And so we're bringing it back. And so that's pretty much what would account for that. What was your other question? Thank you. The number, the number of out of district students uh, this year, and this year's enrollment figure. Yeah, um, it didn't go up as much as we anticipated. You know, I can tell you, um, it didn't go up as much as we anticipated. Last year, we had 24 out of district students, and this year, we got 29. So we expected that number to go up much higher due to the new programs. But I think COVID had a significant impact on drawing kids from out of district. Is that what you call school Thank choice? You. I noticed you had school choice mentioned. Do you call those out of district students? Yeah, so in, in the vocational world, it makes no, no sense. School choice to, is a different number. Yeah, school, for, for, for a vocational school, school choice limits the, the amount of dollars you can charge for a tuition student coming in. So in school choice, if you get it school choice in students, you're probably limited to five fifty five hundred. I don't know what the dollar amount is now. Uh, vocational education is real expensive. So we charge seventeen to $18,000 for <laughs> tuition in students. So it, it, it's the same, but slightly different. We get, we get more bang for each student that comes in uh, dollar-wise um, uh, when we do our regular tuition in amount. So we've get, we but draw from- For your school choice number, I was surprised you know, if it, that it was that high or wondered if that was because you don't have much room, you know, if you're fully subscribed. Well, we get we have to balance both, and we, we draw. So we obviously the Franklin County towns, most of them belong to Franklin County Tech. So we got 19 towns. There's um, you know a handful of small towns that don't belong. The biggest one that doesn't belong is Charlemont, and they they send in students to us, so we get tuition from them, and then we get a we get a decent amount of tuition from the Amherst Pelham towns over in the Amherst region. So we've got students that come in there, but yes, it is a balancing act between, you know, we, we figure our calculation of the, what our building can hold as it currently stands in the middle of 600s. And as Rick explained earlier, we're starting to approach 600. So it's, it's going to get tight as far as uh, accepting outside uh, out of district students. Um, but that would be a nice problem to have if we ever got to that point. I would just want to clarify in the budget where it talks about school choice, that's not, that is money we set aside to offset the students that live in Orange, Massachusetts, primarily, that go to Monty Tech, which is about the same distance away from Franklin County Tech. They can attend Monty Tech if Monty Tech offers a shop program they're interested in that we don't have. So therefore, we're stuck with the school choice tuition. Thank you. Steve or Roy, anything? Yeah, I was just going to inquire. Um, the uh, new veterinary 
uh, or the veterinary program. Has, is that confined to uh, like just pets or are you sort of uh, expanding to uh, broader local, you know, a broader, lar larger animals to given that we have a growing agriculture set, new, newly growing agriculture segment in the county? That's a great question. I'm going to answer it in two parts. The first part is that we are continuing to grow the program and students right now haven't accumulated the um, diagnostic and technical skills required to go out to the farms and do the assessments and the diagnostic of the larger animals. We do have some relationships with some smaller farms to be able to do that. Um, the plan is continuing growth in that area. Small animals is the major way we're going to start off the program so that the students know how to use all the equipment that's required. But eventually, we would like to get into larger animals. We know on Fridays during a typical exploratory week, we like to have a local company who drops off their llamas and cows and sheep and what have you so our students get an idea how to do your analysis take blood samples things like that so it you know you have like a live little noah's ark going on there once in a while but um the real intent of the program is to make sure that they can walk out the door with an approved veterinary assistant certificate and be eligible to go into either veterinary tech programs at the community college level or pre-vet programs at the university level, both of which we have established articulation agreements with. So the program is growing in that regard. Now, the second part of that question is we had a meeting with the state earlier. Um, there is some pushback among the state that had the veterinary programs get involved outside of small animals uh, because they want to reserve that for the larger agricultural vocational schools. Um, so we have a lot of ideas in the future. We do intend to continue to grow the program. And who knows down the road if we become a full-fledged, both a vocational and an agricultural school, which would be part of our goal moving forward. Thank you. Any other questions? None for me. Great. Well, thank you very much. And, and you'll, thank be, you all. you'll be sending your, your budget documents thank to you. Tom and he'll distribute them. Yes. Yeah, yep. we will do that. Yeah. Yep. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye bye. Well, Lori, we have you listed as next. Do you want to go? Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> oh, gee, thanks, Tom. <laughs> okay, well, let's see, which one are we looking at? We're looking at the clerk. Really, I mean, it hasn't changed much from last year and the year before, except I am again asking for that small increase in my salary to bring me up at least close to the lower end of our surrounding towns. Um, but supplies, trainings, meetings, postage, all that is pretty much, pretty much the same. We got the uh, year to date expense from uh, Mike Cachella, a town accountant and your 50.2% of budget, you're, you're, you're right on. <laughs> oh, not bad. I know when I did this, the last uh, spreadsheet wasn't out and I was just over 40%. So <laughs> keep up the good work. <laughs> well, I try not to go over my budget. <laughs> no more special elections. Lori, oh. Lori what's, the, what's, what's the percentage increase from 34, 513 to 375? Um, give me one second and I can tell you off the top of my head. I'm not it's sure. I can tell it you. Was too difficult of a math. It was too difficult of a math problem for me to figure out. So <laughs> I don't believe that for one minute. You know that. <laughs> it's about uh, a 10. About 10%. Yeah. Nine. 9%. 9%. Um, again, uh, basically, 
I'm doing the same thing as Joe Judd is doing. I'm looking at the salaries and the hours worked on our surrounding towns. Like Buckland is at 39,000 a year. Ashfield is about the same and has an assistant. <laughs> so, I mean, we've got our small, the other small towns that are bordering us that are still getting close to 40,000 with a paid assistant also. So I'm just trying to get up to that bottom end. Well, I think you're doing great and you're- you thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Bob. <laughs> the idea that you're at the bottom end doesn't feel right. Thank you, I appreciate that. This is Conway, we're all the bottom end. Now, <laughs> Phil, that doesn't have to be. <laughs> yeah. um, Lori, uh, Lori how, many, how many hours is that uh, supposed to be? Um, well, I'm supposed to work 25 hours a week, but I, I don't, you know, it depends on the time of year. It, it could be 25, it could be 70, depending oh. on what's going on. See, that's not right. Well, when you look at last year, I mean, we had starting with the special town election right into the presidential primaries, into the town meeting, into the local elections, the state primaries. I mean, the entire year was, you know, anywhere between probably 40 and 65 plus hours a week. Well, maybe there ought to be a, uh, a line for, you know, for like, you know, the standard, standard stuff and then another line for contingency or whatever, you know, for the variance that, that occurs year to year. I don't know. Just a thought. I mean, Lori, I think you're doing, I think you're doing a great job. And I, I think, yeah. I think what's interesting is just, um, you know, the, the positive feedback that I get all over town about your job performing. Really nice to hear. Um, I wish I heard more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. No, nobody, nobody tells you. Nobody tells you that because they're worried that they put in a nine for a nine percent salary increase. <laughs> Be quiet. You know, I really wasn't even looking at the percentages. I was just looking at you know numbers of towns surrounding, and just right. you know. Yeah. Stop. Stop. Excuse my dog. He has to get his two cents in. <laughs> What's the travel? You didn't have you know is travel brand new. I did have travel whenever there are a minimum of four conferences a year. Um, one of them is three days back and forth to Springfield. The next one is in, I believe it's in Danvers. And then there's one in Plymouth. There's one in Florence. And there is the New England conference, which this year is in upstate Vermont. Hmm. So the travel and lodging is all the conferences except for the one in Florence. Well, Springfield, I drove to every day, but the other ones I had to stay out for the three days. Seamus, enough. I have no further questions, and I encourage education training. If we can't pay people a lot, we can certainly give them training. Yeah. Make them more invaluable. Right. I mean, I haven't read the only thing I added to it was the actual lodging. Um, they I mean, when I was going to the conferences, it was getting paid for it just wasn't part of the budget. So I think it was just kind of getting moved out from someplace else to cover. Jamie, shush, please. I, I have no further questions. Maybe Thank you. Steve do. I'm not doing ranked choice voting. Um, <laughs> It doesn't look like ranked choice voting has gone through yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was back on the ballot. I do have um, poll pads coming in for our elections department, which is gonna make check-in and check-out a whole lot easier for our girls and easier for the town. I was awarded that grant, a $5,000 grant and used a good hunk of it for the poll pads. Okay, Board of Registers that Tom just put up. I don't think there's any changes at all in that from last year. That's all the same. Yeah. Now, if you guys have any suggestion, I am down. I, I have had two registrars resign this year. 
So if you have any thoughts of anybody um, that would like to be on the board, I would appreciate any input you have. I'm having a hard time finding people. Who are you looking for? Anybody. I need a Democrat and a Republican, um, preferably two Republicans and a Democrat, so I can chair a little more out of the counting. Um, the responsibilities aren't even really all that much. The hardest part is they can't be on any other board or committee. Do you so know, have, do you know Tammy Bennett? Yeah, um, well, I know Kathy. I don't know Tammy. Yes. Yeah, um, Tammy. Tammy's her daughter. That would right. be a good. That would be a good. A good. Her. She's not on any committees, but always sort of interested. Sort of. Oh, so, beautiful. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna put her down, and I'll reach out to her. Thank you, Phil. Yeah. Yeah. So, if you can come up with a brief statement of responsibilities, you know, we can post it on the web and see if anybody's interested. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, I was thinking of posting it in a few places again. Uh, this is Lee, and I'd like to just make one comment uh, with regard to the elections. Uh, Laurie has really stepped right up to that and learned that process, which is totally separate from any other process in town, and has done a wonderful job with it. Thank you, Lee. You're welcome. Agreed. Agreed. Oh, that is very much appreciated. And Lee, I hope you can be there more than just for counting this year. Well, <laughs> we'll see how it all works out. <laughs> I consider it an honor. So Lori, you're also the one that's titled elections, that budget. Yes, I am, Bob. I have all sorts of places I'm part of. Yeah, <laughs> which there's no change of either. So. Um, the only thing is I did put in a line item for a piece of equipment I would like to have for our state and federal elections. Um, it, is a, it is an expensive piece. Um, I don't know if you guys want to have it on a light item or you'd rather I moved it over to a capital request. It is a one-time purchase of a scanner tabulator from LHS, which will definitely increase the speed at the end of our nights for state and federal elections. Um, I wouldn't be using it for local. We would stay with the old fashioned box, but for all the state and presidentials, it would definitely be a huge help. Uh, Lori, so yes, sir. Does, that, does that scan that long ballot? Um, it will, instead of putting X's, you're going to have one of those ballots where you fill in the little circle and okay. it, it scans the ballot. It automatically tabulates it. And if there's any write-ins on it, it will automatically separate the write-ins and put them into a separate bin for hand counting at the end of the night. And, um, if ranked choice voting were to come through, um, if it happens, then what we would have to do is we would just take one of those flashcards and deliver it to the central tabulation facility as opposed to delivering our physical ballots. If we do not have a tabulator, we have to hand over our physical ballots at the end of the night. So we lose custody of them. And someone would have to drive them there? Yes, it would be me and a police officer would have to drive from there to, we don't know where the facility is going to be. It could be Greenfield, could be Springfield, could be Fitzfield, could be Worcester. Who knows? We're hoping it's the county seat and it's only as far as Greenfield. But at the end of the night, yeah, we have to either deliver the ballots or the flashcard to that facility. So for state and federal elections, we would no longer crank our ballots? No, you wouldn't crank. You would feed it into a machine. Um, it would know right away if there was any errors. If you had double voted or missed a, missed one, it would ask you, you know, you didn't vote in this particular, do you want to? And so you have that option. It takes a couple seconds for it to go through, but it's, you know, it's worth the wait. And instead of being there till well after midnight, we might be out of there by 10. <laughs> Can you make it ring a bell if your ballot is, is accepted? Um, I can, if you would like me to, I can get, I, I can get one of those, uh, desktop hotel bells. 
So could I hear just from anybody an opinion about whether the piece of equipment should be, is, if it's over 5,000, isn't it capital? Yeah, I think so. Uh, I think so. And wouldn't that be the more appropriate place for it? I don't. Well, except yeah, that would be a great $5,000 request and above to become except, a uh, separate warrant. Except this, this particular piece of equipment is totally uh, ingrained in like in a policy and in you know the way we do things that it's kind of the tip of the iceberg i don't mean in cost but it is in terms of discussing you know it'd be at some point i assume the commonwealth is going to do away with the manual mark ballot is you know the the, the long uh, fanful thing that we use is that correct there are currently only 31 towns left in the yeah. Commonwealth that are using it. Okay. Well, that answers the question, I guess. <laughs> Sorry, can you still call this capital equipment? Right now, yes, our limit is 5,000. Um, the committee hasn't, would really rather it were 10,000, but a couple of years ago, the committee lowered it to five. Okay, so um, Tom, Good if you argument. could, go ahead. Uh, well, Bob, you're the chair. You can you can call a meeting if you want on this. Well, uh, either that or Tom, if you want to, if you can walk me through uh, how to put in the request for a capital expense, I've never done one, so I'm not sure. I don't mean now. <laughs> right. I don't know that we're going to call a meeting before the capital equipment. Capital committee appears before this board next week, but we could do it definitely before. I mean, we're going to be having more meetings before before town meeting. Yeah, <coughs> I hope. Yeah. I mean, I could knock it down to five thousand and then um, so take the other seven hundred out of my office supplies. No, no, you can charge whatever you want. It's just. Well, I meant to keep it out of the capital to keep it to keep it out of the capital request. I can drop uh -oh. that down to five. Does that include education and training? Any kind of instruction on this? Does it need it? It, it, in, it includes all the training I need. Yes. It's the whole kit and caboodle, so to speak. It's all right. The whole kit. Yeah, the whole kit and caboodle. Thank Tom, you. Do you want to send Lori a capital form? Sure. Um, if the training is worth a thousand dollars, the equipment's worth oh, yeah. five thousand. Just point that out too. Um, it, it, if it's not broken out, yeah, easy for them. Well, they didn't. I don't think it was broken out. Well, I'm going to kill my dog. Troy. Could you get him out of here, please? Um, let me take a quick peek and see if it was broken down in my quote. Damn it! I will momentarily. Yeah. Uh, oh my goodness, where is he? Of course, I might not be able to find it now, just because I need it. No, when I look on my phone, my emails will not go back far enough. But maybe... Hmm. Yeah, I think I have to be at work to get hold of this ancient email. Well, Tom can send you the form, which is very easy, and okay, talk to you, or he could talk to you, or whatever. It's okay. That that works. I mean, we have plenty of time on that, obviously. Yeah. And as far as capital expenses go, as far as capital expense, you know, capital expenses go. This, is, this would be one of the easier ones to have to present at town meetings just because it's so understandable. It's you know, tangible. And, right. uh, and, and um, you know, I, I wouldn't worry about it like it just because it's capital, so. Right, now if I look at this and I look at the breakdown and it turns out that the equipment is under 5,000 and the, um, the service contract and the, and the training and all of that is what the balance is. Do you still want me to do it as a capital, or do you want me to break no. it down? And do it? No, then it then it would be back on your on your back on the budget. Budget, yeah. Okay. 
I would think that's not yeah. my call, I guess, but. Perfect, okay. Because I do, I'm not sure, but I do have a feeling that it is broken down. And any other questions for Lori? I have no further questions, Lori. Thank you. Thank you. Both. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you're welcome. You, Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the great job you're doing. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, I guess I'm all done. <laughs> thank you. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Have a good night, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Lori. You too. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. So, Lee, are you there still? Tom's okay. got your sheet up. She's muted. Well. Well, while we're waiting for Lee, Tom Hutchinson, have you any idea of what the uh, percentage of certified new growth is in our current our current levy base is? You know, the full fair and cash value of our levy base. I think last year it was about two hundred sixty-eight and a half million. Has it gone up? Has it gone up by more than one percent? Do you know? Uh, I really want to wait for Lee to answer that question. All right. It's the 64 cent question of the evening. <laughs> Thank you. Tom, while we're waiting for Lee, do you want to go over the money items? Uh, no, I think Lee's on now. Okay. Lee, I have you being as unmuted, but I can't hear you. I don't see, see her little square. We all heard. Oh, her. no. She, she just went off. He's off now. Well. Uh, okay, I, I can I can uh, I can do the money items, but um, if Lee comes back on, I'd like to, you know, let her do her thing and get off. Good. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Oh, um she reports that their uh, phone line is dead and she's trying another approach. <laughs> okay. Um, so what I've done, you know, what I do is I, I compile over the year, um, all kinds of requests and notes and things like that. And this represents, uh, everybody can see the non-capital money items up here. You got that on your screen share? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, the, uh, the Capital Improvements Planning Committee is going to have um, a report on the top two items next time. Hello, back again. Hi, Lee. Hi. Oh, Sorry about that. It seems that the handset died on uh, my phone. At any rate, here we are. I don't have video, but I hope you have audio. Are you prepared yes. to go or do you want a moment to compose yourself? Oh, sure. Well, you're up. Okay. All right. Um, I'm guessing that Tom has put up the budget request sheet that we had sent in. Yep. Yes. Okay. I do have a couple of changes to that immediately. If you go down half a page uh, to the second box below the main topic, it says assessors clerical requested. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to change my hours to 26 a week. 
which would bring my total for the year down to 30987 plus change and make the column total there 54245 and And moving that figure back up to the main graph into cell M7, putting the 54,246 up there. Sorry to be so complicated. Gives us a bottom line of $71,054. That's our current bottom line. Mm -hmm. Is that what you're showing at the moment? Yeah. Well, wait a minute. Let me just double check. M6 through 8, yep. Well, okay. All right. But I just wanted to get that pushed from 30 hours down to 26. Because the conversion is done, I no longer need those extra four hours a week. Um, might as well take them right off now. And then take another few off again next year in order to be ready to transfer it over to a new person a couple of years down the road. You'll see, as, as Laurie had noted in hers, that our general expenses run pretty flat. Mike and I have finally sorted out exactly how to categorize our various GIS tax map and valuation expenses into three categories. And so that's now quite clear um, as to what amount is being designated toward whom and for what service. Um, our subscription with Tyler Valuation Services, our annual subscription, begins uh, unsupported by the state this this year. As this current year we're in is at $3,775, and that figure is holding for next year. And the state is apparently going to assist us in negotiating with Tyler for a future multi-year contract. The CSC component of $335. Three hundred thirty-three seventy-five, I think, will be ending at the, after this year. As you can see, I've put money back in for a trainee to learn my job, and I'm very hopeful that we'll be able, COVID-wise and so forth, to advertise early in fiscal 22 if the money is available to bring someone right in and start right up at um, 10 hours a week. I'd like to offer that person $18 an hour. Um, the way the figures are working out in the clerical requested. Our clerk currently receives $15.39 an hour, which is the lowest in the county. She has a number of years of experience and the board voted to ask if we could increase hers to $16. It would still be low, but it would be um, more appropriate, shall we say. Same number of hours a week, no change there. And therefore, I would like the trainee to be coming in at 18 because almost immediately the trainee would be doing work more detailed and comprehensive than our clerk does. Our clerk does pretty basic clerical work and not a great deal of assessing except in the motor vehicle excise uh, abatement end of things. Lee, can you get me your revised? Um, I will. Yeah. Thank you. I, I can't get it to you right this second. Yeah, sure. Yeah. But um, those are basically the changes. Um, and what we'd like to ask for. You really made it through the conversion. Boy, that's... Oh, yes. In fact, it was this weekend that I finally sent the final figures in 
to uh, our local advisor, and she will go over them all and will, you know, sort out any anomalies that she might find, but I don't expect much. The um, interesting thing is that the new values are coming in, let's see, and overall uh, about uh, averaging, say, 3% above what they were across the board. So we've picked up about, oh, three. Point eight million there in, in value due to the, the conversion. It's not new growth. We do have two point uh, four million in new growth real estate plus another. Hang on. Another. Well, another uh, similar figure. So we're just about a four point seven million altogether in new growth for this year, which is just about $89,000 in revenue. That's what we'll be reporting. And we're certainly on the timeline for bills to go out on time. And we're also in the beginning stages. You've all received your yellow form, the hateful yellow form, uh, <laughs> for the recertification revaluation which is also this year. Personal property. Oh, yes. If only the state had taken the time to do two separate forms, one for business, one for individuals, everyone's life would have been simpler. But they apparently had the need to combine the two, and it's a miserable form for everyone involved. But at any rate, people are being very, very good about asking questions about it and trying hard to to do their part. We appreciate that so, so very much. Um, they're coming in like, like hotcakes. And so that the reval will be on schedule. As usual, we've hired Roy Bishop to do our commercial and industrial. He will do the hydro plant. And we also have to have an outside appraisal done of the new large solar array out on Main Poland Road, and he will do that. He does them in many communities and has for many years. So that's good to have that all in one in one package as far as the consultant uh, contractor is concerned. So those figures will be for fiscal 2022 and uh, will be on the fall billing. We, uh, Alan Singer here. Hi, uh, Alan. Hi. Uh, with regard to general expenses, mm -hmm. I got the uh, report from Mike Coachella. You're about three quarters of your budget through the end of um, January. Oh, when I did it at the end of December, we were right on at 50%. Well, here's my question. Do you think, I don't know. I think what, he's what putting... We've we we've had a couple of times where he has put revaluation expenses into our regular budget, and I've yeah. had to ask him to move them back out. Okay. And that may that well have happened again. Okay. All right. I will look into that right away, yes. Well, thank you. And then uh, would you want to put any extra item here, budget light item, for a training for the new uh, – the new? No, uh, just what's in there um, for the, um, you know, 10 hours a week at 18 – that's enough, you think? Okay. Right. I believe so, yes. For starting out, I mean, a person may start out, you know, at six hours a week and work up to 12 and have an average of 10 over the course of the year. We'll um, see how it goes. I what don't about know, outside um, trainings? Is there anything you would foresee that might be needed? There, Yes, there is a course in August. It's a one-week program at UMass. Okay. All right. And um, <laughs> that can be done next year. No. And I think that would be more appropriate next year. When they've had some under their belt. Okay. That's it's going to make a great for, deal more sense. That's the retention yeah, I, bonus. <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's a very um, daunting course to go into when you're just brand new to the field. Mm. Now, yeah. curiosity, Liv, what you had just sent to the state, what's our levy and appropriate base uh, for this fiscal year? It looks like we'll be, what did I say? Um, About $270 million, or is it higher? 
Uh, no, not that high. Uh, 258? 258. Mm-hmm. Somewhere in that vicinity. 258. Mm-hmm. Okay. I haven't transferred the figures over into the uh, recap yet. Okay. Don't dare until we get them approved. <laughs> Yes, yes, understood. Until we get the values approved. I don't want to jinx them right. anyway. All right. uh, Thank you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it just like a note for another one or two percent increase in our uh, property taxes for this year based on our budget that we're looking at so far, given the lack of new growth. Thank you. Yes, but the, this new growth will help, and quite frankly, the increased um, valuation from the conversion will also help to absorb some of that. Thank you. I have no further questions. Uh, just a note for anybody who is looking at the budget figures from our accountant. Yes, he does include figures that are not part of the operating budget in the readout. If you're interested in the operating budget, you, you have to look at the, the only the 5,100 and 5,400 items. And I can explain that further to anybody who wants, but uh, that, yeah. that's the operating budget. Mm-hmm. Our operating uh, budget is supposed okay. to be under account number 141 and the revaluation under 142. Yeah. Thank you. And we, we would ask once again for our annual $5,000 uh, to go into future revaluation. This is becoming something of a, I don't know if you can call it a revolving account, but it's a, you know, we feed into it every year and then we take out the expenses in the couple of years during which a reval is taking place and then continue to feed into it because revaluations do cross the fiscal uh, fiscal year dates. Yes. Anything else? I don't know how you do everything you do. Thank you. We appreciate you, Lee. Oh, thank, thank you very, you very much. much. I have no uh, further questions. Roy or Steve, or have you have you any questions? No, we're all good. No, I'm, good. I'm fine. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, everyone. We're okay, good. well, you know, good, you know answer. where to find me if if you have any. Just hit the email, though. <laughs> okay, still, thank, thank you very much, everyone. I'm still, I'm, still everyone. Trying, I'm still trying to get over the sadness from. Hearing her say she's leaving in a couple years. So yeah. Wow. Well, hopefully this trainee is going to work out really well and be, you know, be a Conway. It'd be wonderful to a Conway resident who's happy to be here and working in town. And boy, that'd be ideal, wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah. We'll see how it works. Thank you all. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. So, Tom, are you up next? I think I think that concludes the finance committee for joint portion, correct? Well, Tom was going to do go over some of the money items if you want to hear it. I don't think they're they're not like a budget, but you might have lost him. Where's Tom? You might have lost Tom. Are you there, Tom? He might not be. There he is. Oh, sorry. Oh, there he is. I was yeah. muted. I'm trying to get this thing up at the same time. Here. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, the, this is everything that's come across my desk. Um, and I will note um, that the first two items are, are uh, items being considered by the Capital Improvements Planning Committee. Uh, transfer to stabilization is the usual amount. Uh, Conway Grammar School is asking for a generator. I'm suggesting taking that from their capital stabilization. We do need to uh, shore up the technical school's budget line because we have an extra student at Smith Boak. Uh, and that's about about seventeen or eighteen thousand dollars for both tuition and transportation. I put in a, a total of 35,000 here. If, if that doesn't do it, we can sort it out at the end of the year with uh, transfers between accounts or from stabilization. Uh, we have the usual um, can ambulance. Can I ask you a question about Smith Oak? Just while, while we're talking yeah. about 
It sounded like yeah. we pay on our tuition the previous year on our on our number of students the previous year. So it is that true? We have two. We had two last year. Yeah, this is because we don't find out how many students we have until the beginning of the school year. Because they said we had four last year. Oh. Four I don't think we're... Four this year, so they would bill us for four next year, no, and they're that, anticipating that is, possibly eight next year. That was the Franklin County Technical School. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh. ah. Yeah, Smith Folk. Is there what kind of an agreement do we have with Smith Folk? Yeah. If the right. Franklin County Tech does not offer a particular field of study, the town is obliged to send the student to a school that does offer that and to pay for their transportation. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the reasons I my little heart went pitter patter when Rick said he was going to uh, they were going to try to get an agricultural program because we, we lose a lot to that. The other one we lose to is law enforcement. They have law enforcement at Smith as well. Um, and then uh, I wanted to bring the capital stabilization of Conway Grammar School, that fund back to its 250,000. We have the regular contribution towards ambulance operations. The assessors have asked for a shelving system that would cost about $21,000. What? It just seems like I, yeah, I. What? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's complicated because what it has to do is hold a whole lot of weight and be and be movable so that you can you can essentially have just one aisle they have two aisles now and what they would do is they would put everything in in this shelving system where you could just use one aisle and move things back and forth to get to whichever side of the shelf you wanted um would that be I a should have had maybe would that be a Sorry? separate line item on the in, in the warrant? Would that be a separate warrant article? Yeah, all of these are separate warrant articles. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Um, the uh, usual request for twenty thousand for mm -hmm. retiree health benefits, OPEB. Uh, Jan and I are proposing um, a retroactive pay raise for the staff for this fiscal year because we did not have the revenue shortage we thought we were going to have. Nice. Good. Yeah, I remember that. Um, the, um, the agreement we made when we came up with the funding plan for the highway facility, really, rather than the garage, was, uh, well, what we were going to, the maintenance, what we borrowed for was that a certain amount was going to come from free cash every year to offset the amount that uh, taxpayers would have to pay. This amount brings it down to the amount that taxpayers would have to pay after 10 years of borrowing. So it's a 20 year loan. We, we uh, sort of front the money for everything that's above what they're gonna pay 10 years into the loan in interest. And this year it's fourteen nine twenty three. The frontier capital expense we were asked for only five thousand seven hundred twelve dollars. I um, am suggesting that they come up with their own stabilization fund, but I think there are sort of there are administrative questions about doing that. We have one. We have a stabilization fund. It, it has eleven thousand dollars in it. Okay, so not enough for this particular ask. Um, uh, here's the five thousand that Lee was talking about for the annual contribution to recertification. We have two prior year expenses. One is from Tyler Equipment, um, the highway uses a lot of Tyler equipment. And for some reason, this 
invoice got lost. We always contribute to the library in order to maintain its accreditation. We have to um, submit a, a really minimal amount, but there has to be a contribution from the municipality for the library to being accredited. Uh, we also have prior year expenses from Baker office supply. We get uh, most of our office supplies from Baker in, in Greenfield. And uh, there was a point where their email started being treated as spam by our system and we never got them in time to pay them. So uh, this represents the last three months or so uh, of the last fiscal year. And uh, we've been asked for uh, $570 from the Board of Health to pay a prior year's stipend. So, t That's Tom, I got a, a couple of questions. So, first of yeah. all, the, the generator for the Conway Grammar School, it's also for, uh, it's also for our emergency shelter. Um, and I, I just just to let you all know, the initial estimate for that that was presented to the Frontier uh, uh, Budget Committee was sixty thousand dollars, and they were told to keep shopping. Um, but the 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 uh, I did confirm with Bob Baker, and so I forget who else that that generator is shot and really does need to get replaced. Um, but the, usually when there's a withdrawal from the grammar school capital stabilization, the amount that we put back into it is usually correlated to that. Um, so, I mean, if, you know, if, if, if the generator is, I don't know, 55 or 50, then um, that 34,000 the contribution would still cause the fund to, uh, you know, decrease, not, go back to any level. So uh, that, I mean, so, so maybe, maybe that number, you might want to wait to see what the generator comes in at. I don't know. Um, yeah. I, I, I guidance I've been given before was to keep it at 250,000. Um, if, if, right. if the grammar school wants to raise the level that it keeps its capital stabilization fund at, that's, that's fine. But I, no, this is the no. first I've heard of that. Yeah. No, we don't. That that number is based on the cost of total replacement of both boilers. Um, so that that's the whole basis for that number, and that's still two hundred and fifty. So, um, the the um, what what was the other thing? Oh, okay. So so the the retroactive pay raise. So um, so that's that's two percent, right? That was that represents two point five. Which was 25. the original? It, that was the original proposal. Right. It's also so, so, um, it, it was exact at the time, but uh, Jan tells me that she wants to recalculate the figure, and it may change slightly. And it right. would change even more if if there were a different percent that the board wanted. So one of the things that that when I'm con when I'm considering this, and one of the things that you know prior to tonight most of the departments that came in kept their salary line items the same as last year and left it up to the select board and the finance committee to determine uh wage increase tonight's uh department submissions all included salary increases all by themselves and so like you know i just want to make sure that i don't know about make sure but um, if, if someone is, you know, if, if a given salary position includes a 9% budget increase or a 9% increase for this year, do they still get last year? Thanks, I think, uh, hold on Tom and, and Phil, I think that, um, the 15,290 is for hourly people and the clerk. And the assessor, I think, are uh, are salaried, right? Well, um, yeah. let, let me let me answer Phil, Phil's question first. Um, this has to do with last year's pay, um, so they would get they they would be in, they're included in that fifteen too. Um, 
but it's true that that what uh, what Lori was suggesting was a rise from that earlier level. The the thing is, she's not proposing a a a she's not saying I want a nine percent rise. She's saying I want to hit this particular figure because this particular figure reflects um, something closer to what the other towns are getting. So so she has that final figure in mind when when she made her request and and she and she would not get you know the two point five percent on top of that. You know, she's she's made a very particular request for a very particular number, so that's that. Um, and Lee has but, as but well. Like, yeah. But but like for instance, like the the Lee's clerk or whatever that she wanted to raise from fifteen twenty nine to sixteen, the fifteen twenty nine plus last year's two and a half percent plus this year's two or two and a half percent would be over sixteen. So. Um, do we still, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Do, do you see my question? Again, she, asked, she asked for a particular rate of pay. So I, I think she would get that particular rate of pay. All right. I guess is, is someone keeping track though of who, of who's asked for more on the salary line item in their own department budget so that you can, we can then take a look at, I guess, when we're determining this year's, pay raised um, for staff, w whether or not to, in fairness, whether to, to apply it. Phil, I think you're asking well, if we do this pay raise, does that raise the basis for where we start for this year? In other words, nobody, maybe people aren't asking for quite enough by level funding. No, well, everyone except people who are asking for particular raises. Now, now that's a raise as opposed to what we might consider more of a cost of living increase, which is the 2.5 or two or whatever percent gets decided on. So everyone, when they submit is for, for their regular wages is submitting level funded. Uh, and yes, um, I, what we would do is we would, we would calculate next year's as a 2.5% rise over the rise that they got last year. Otherwise we're just, we're staying a year behind. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm rather new to this um, process, but it seems like the heading on this says non-capital money items. Your second item says a truck for the highway, that's a capital <laughs> item. Let me finish my question. That's usually a capital item on budgets I've seen in the past. Are you actually buying a truck for $220,000? Yes, and it would be a capital item. Yeah, well, how come yeah. it's going on, a cap, on the non-capital item side? Yeah, the first thing that I said was the first two items on here are, are – being dealt with by the capital improvements planning committee and in that sense the heading is wrong um it should just say money items okay so that's okay mm. there you go. done all right so it all comes out of a capital fund that you have a separate fund each year besides the operating fund for capital that's items yes um, it can, you know, that's our choice. What have you done um, for years? Uh, Steve, just so you know, uh, Bob is the chair of the Capital Improvements Planning Committee. Roy Cohen is a member, a representative from the Finance Committee. And there's also uh, Trisha Vin Casey, a former town administrator of a much larger town, uh, who's the third member of that committee. And we'll okay. be talking next week about capital items. Okay, that's a separate budget from these operating departments is what you have? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm, I was late a little bit. But, uh, you might have talked about this earlier. I was a couple minutes late here getting started. But okay. And I understand it. Okay. Thank you for the explanation. Well, Ron came in and talked about his operating budget already, right? But right. he didn't talk right. about capital items like buying trucks. 
the what's why is this highway paving? What is that? Why is that in a capital? We'll, we'll talk about that next week. Okay. We, All right. Yeah. That's, maybe I'll answer some of my questions. I'm just sort of going <laughs> slow because I I don't really understand this yet. <laughs> right. It doesn't fit quite well. Yeah. And, and the reason I included them on this list is because I use this then to generate the town meeting warrant. Um, and all of these are separate articles in the town meeting warrant. So I was just keeping track of all of them in one place. Uh, so sorry, that was confusing. All right. Thank you. So Tom Hutchinson said you're going to revise this a bit, this uh, Mighty Items, and send it out prior to uh, next Monday evening's meeting. Is that what you have in mind? I don't recall having to see this. We can't hear you, yeah. Tom. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and and you'll, you'll Phil, the bottom. For Phil, Phil Cantor. So, uh, so the Conway Grammar School is the side of that 250,000 is the uh, ideal number for the stabilization fund. Last year, as I recall, there was still some discussion as to the, the rationale for that figure, to, for arriving at that figure. Is that right? I mean, yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's right. And, and, but it's not like a, a, a religious like necessity to be right at that number. I mean, we're we want to be in that ballpark, though. Yeah, but, I guess it would change subject to the estimated increased cost to replace the boilers for the school. And I guess the roof, uh, too. Right? I mean, those are the two well, we know right? we know what the cost of the because the boilers are, are already 10 years past their expiration date. OK, um, but but they function, they work. But the, the problem with boilers is that uh, they, they could break and it cost a thousand dollars and they could break and it cost a hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And it depends exactly what needs to get replaced. So uh, we, we wanted to just not have to replace them until they need to be replaced, but then we need the money to do it when we need to do it. So yep. that's why it is. I think and then the generator of the Conway Grammar School, is that the installed price? Have you gotten firm quotes in how how real is that number? I'm just leery right now because with the pandemic, uh, the figures for equipment are unfortunately continuing to go all over the place. Yeah, that is that is the, the price installed with concrete pad. All right, thank you. I have no further questions. I, I can wait till next month. <coughs> All right. So you done, Tom? Yeah, and. Uh, Please, please send me any questions in the in the meantime, so I can uh, start to generate some answers. Thank you, Tom. And I think that is it for the for the finance committee business. Right, I think it is. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, everyone. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Off. Take care. Have a good one. Bye bye. Tom, you have an, art, an article here for opening the warrant. Uh, yeah, we were actually supposed to do that before the money articles. <laughs> and it's it's kind of formal, um, but it helps uh, when you're when you close it. That if people come in late, um, if it's too much of a pain to consider what they're asking for, you can just say, "Well, this is too late." So what's more important is closing the warrant, but in order to close it, you have to open it. So a, a vote to open the warrant would be welcome. Is there any complication or can we just vote to open the warrant? I, I don't I, I think it's straightforward. So I, I, I make a motion that we vote today to open the, the warrant for the town meeting. Second. Yes. Favor. Aye. Good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, items not anticipated. I I think there was one more item of new business. Uh, oh, signing the CARES Act. Yes, there is. You want? Is there someone here to talk about that? From FERCOG? No. Yeah. yeah, I 
I, I can do that. This is just um, because the CARES Act got extended, our agreement with the FERCOG to, to work with them, you know, we, we, we did the public health part of it last time, um, but now we have to do this part of it, which is just changing the preamble to the general agreement that says um, that they can work on our behalf until December 31st, 2021, which is the, the new extended date of the CARES Act. So we're just amending, amending the agreement to 1231. Yes. So I'll make a and motion. Then, Bob, yeah, that seems uh, fair. I think. Well. Go ahead. I think it's just the one signature on it. So I'll make a motion that we amend the CARES Act to extend the uh, agreement date to 1231-21. I support that. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. Yes. Okay. Erica, I think I heard you seconding it. So I did. Yes. <laughs> Great, thank you. <laughs> so does anybody have an item unanticipated? I have an item unanticipated, and okay. if it's complicated, we can say we don't want to do it. Um, in the last few days, there have been a lot of requests that municipalities, Conway, whatever, um, who are green communities would support um, what's called a net zero stretch code. That then it was an item that was in the climate budget that was passed almost unanimously by the House and the Senate in Massachusetts. And, um, and Governor Baker is listening, you know, as he should, to some of the real estate uh, companies who are opposing it. There are many who are for it, but, but uh, and, and he's got now about eight more days to sign the repassed uh, climate bill that has been sent back to his desk. And it's really just a, to sign on to a letter that that is in, that's encouraging Governor Baker to sign the climate bill and that we support a net zero stretch code, which would, which would require uh, homes to be built so with, uh, with enough renewable energy capability that they would be net zero and well insulated. So it's something that all of our reps and senators all support, they all supported this in the climate bill and it's really, um, it's that we support our reps and senators position to change the stretch code to be net zero. Did you send that to us, Bob? I did not send it to you. So I don't have something to send. I could okay. do that if, you know, I didn't know whether everyone might be aware of it. Um, if you don't want to do it, it's absolutely fine. It's just something that came up and I got a number of letters today asking if municipalities might do this. I would just want to read it. I would want to read everything <laughs> related to it before. You know, there is an unintended, there's a, there's a significant societal unintended consequence for very well insulated new homes. And that's a dramatically increased rate of lung cancer deaths due to radon gas. And um, that, that there, there's no place for that gas to go when there's no uh, breezes coming in through the basement. Not for the lungs. Uh, <laughs> right. So, 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 I mean, but that is true. That is true. And, um, I'm not opposed yeah, to, I, just, I don't want to agree to anything that I haven't like read and, you know, okay. So we don't have to do it, but I just wanted, okay. no, yeah. no, I mean, okay. I, oh, yeah, I, it. It. I will, that would be an easy pass. Um, it's very, and, and there, there, there's an additional unintended consequence. Uh, some people have raised the question of, uh, how, how, what the effect would be on the cost of houses uh, to do this? And some people are saying it, it would, um, it would, it would worsen the affordable housing problem in Massachusetts. I don't have any facts or figures about that, but that is one argument that was put up um, as a concern about, you know, make, making things more, you know, reaching 
the peak of energy efficiency is that it's just a more expensive habit. And there are just as many people who say it won't, or that in the long run, it saves a lot of money, but it does, it does raise the short-term selling cost of the house, right? Okay, Tom, do you have an update? Why, yes, I do. A um, uh, couple of uh, pieces of committee news. Um, well, Lee already went over the rise in taxable property values, um, which of course is good for the town. Uh, however, it might be unwelcome for individuals. Tax rates will go up less than they might have, even though the average tax bill might rise. Uh, also, I've set up a joint meeting with the Council on Aging uh, scheduled for February 18th to discuss their offerings and their place relative to other senior centers. I've also invited Lynn Hanley to attend while making sure she knows she is eligible to participate in Children Falls Senior Center activities. In departmental news, uh, House lawmakers voted Thursday to extend emergency pandemic era rules for six months delaying a debate over rules that usually takes place at the start of every two-year session. Um, this includes um, the, the, uh, some of the provisions that uh, towns, cities and towns have to be able to do what they, what, what, we, what we're doing now, meeting remotely, that sort of thing. And the New England Forestry Foundation will be taking over the management of the Mohawk Trail Woodlands Partnership from the current consortium, which is made up of the FERCOG, the Berkshire Regional Planning Council, and the Franklin Land Trust. Uh, and finally, we did not receive a reply from the UCC's engineer, the church's engineer, to our letter about the old foundation. We did get a call from Marcus McLaurin. Bob has been in touch with him regarding that request for town funds. But as far as I know, we have uh, had no response from him or the UCC up at, at this point. Marcus wants to come in and talk and he wants to bring the engineer in and explain their position. Great. He's supposed to call us back oh, and, well, you know. Right, but, but we haven't heard from him that he, you know, when, when he wants to do that. Maybe have a, maybe have the uh, our highway boss on that as well. Yeah. That's all I have. Any concerns of the selectmen? Nope. Any ma'am? Nope. Nope. Any announcements? Um. Yeah, the uh, the decision today. We uh, the school regrets the decision today to have a half day of school. We were the Frontier Union Thirty Eight was the only school in the county that had school today, uh, and at, at, apparently at like four in the morning, it, it still seemed like snow was a few hours off, but sort of six in the morning there was an inch or two on the ground. So, um, uh, they I did. I had did. a snow day. My like remote work was canceled today. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, how bad um, for kids who? So there was there was sort of a, a mini mutiny uh, amongst the families in amongst our in our four towns today. That uh, usually you know usually we get criticism for closing when there's no snow. I know, yeah, you can't win. Yeah, so of course you you also get the criticism for opening when there is snow. But um, so sorry everybody that was really put out. So. So everybody had to go into school during the snow and yeah. instead of you, sh you should have had a half day in the first half. Yeah. And then seeing that, seeing that 11, 1130, the, 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 all the snow plows, the right in front of the bus, you know, leading the buses all throughout town. That was, you never, you, you never, I mean, I'm glad they do that, but you never really like, that's not how you want to do your school, but yeah. So our next meeting is next week, February 8th. 6 p.m. Yes. By Zoom right here. Yeah. So we'll adjourn the meeting. 